if his goal was to, you know, effectively and and reliably communicate about this complex topic, I think he's done extremely <laughs> badly. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Dr. Sam Gregson, particle physicist here again. I hope you've had a fantastic week and have a really exciting weekend in store. Now this week, the science discussions on Twitter, like it or not, have been dominated by the idea that the publishing of climate change science may be in crisis. Dr. Patrick Brown, co-director of the climate and energy team at the Breakthrough Institute and an adjunct faculty member in the Energy Policy and Climate Programme at Johns Hopkins University, wrote an article in Barry Weiss's Free Press claiming that he deliberately left key information and variables out of a paper studying forest fires. Brown claims that high-impact science journals such as Nature and Science strongly favour climate change studies that have simple narratives and that make obvious connections between greenhouse gas emissions and negative outcomes, such as forest fires or agricultural yield disruption. Brown claims that it's very difficult to get prestigious journals to take papers that discuss all the variables that impact issues such as forest fires, variables such as climate change, forestry management, local policy, and other issues. He claims researchers know this and tailor their analyses to be simplistic and hyper-focused on the impact of greenhouse gases, as he has done. He claims that these biases lead to the public being misinformed about the whole story of climate change and distort policy. For example, leading to potentially helpful climate change mitigation strategies being de-emphasized. These alleged biases, Brown argues, are born out of a desire to make it clear to the public and policymakers that measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions should be emphasized over all other competing mitigation policies, such as better forestry management. In short, Brown believes that climate change scientists are acting somewhat like political activists in order to get published in high-impact journals, and that the prestige output of the field is therefore being hopelessly distorted. To help me dig into this incredibly controversial, fraught, and politically charged matter, I'm joined by a fantastic special guest, Professor Ken Rice. Professor Rice is a professor of computational astrophysics at the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Edinburgh, and also part of the Scottish University's Physics Alliance. He also has a keen interest in the scientific communication of controversial topics and predominantly climate change. Professor Rice has spent years debunking climate change misinformation and championing how climate change information should be accurately portrayed to the public. He has engaged with many climate change sceptical podcasters and pundits and maintains the blog And Then There's Physics, where he carefully breaks down discussions around controversial, politically charged topics such as economics, COVID and climate change. His latest piece centers on the recent brouhaha around the publishing of climate change studies in high impact journals such as Nature and Science. So let's get his thoughts on the recent claims that climate change publishing is in crisis. So, Ken, as someone that keeps a very keen eye on the communication of climate science, um, especially to the general public, can you give me uh, and the viewers here a brief overview of the claims that Dr. Patrick Brown has made this week and why they've been uh, taken so seriously in some quarters? Okay, so I guess I guess the background is him publishing this paper on wildfires in California, which I think he had a big thread on a few weeks ago when he was excited about it. But he's now kind of updated that in a bit and is claiming that, you know, he had to satisfy a particular narrative in order to get it into this high impact journal, right? That these journals would only accept climate papers with a specific narrative and that in fact it's the whole scientific community who is sort of against any other narrative. Right? And, and it's a narrative that, that greenhouse gases are kind of the be yeah. all and end all when it comes to negative it's, impact. So if we're talking about more wildfires, more wildfire area being burnt, yeah. well, that's pretty much all down to uh, greenhouse gas emissions and yeah. and people don't really want to hear about 
mitigation by forestry management or, or better local policies or things like this. They want to hear that bottom line, greenhouse gas is bad. And, and that's yeah. kind of the narrative. And I guess the logic and theory is that emission reductions are crucial and hence we shouldn't generate any narrative that might undermine that. Right. right. That if we start a narrative saying, well, maybe we can just have better forest ma management or whatever, that that would undermine, you know, emission reduction arguments. So the idea, so the idea there is that, that the journals are doing this either consciously or subconsciously <laughs> because they they want because that idea of reducing greenhouse gases is so important um, to them that they only put certain things through that kind of push that idea. Exactly. And, and not only just the journals, but that entire scientific community is yeah. is yeah. behind this. Right? Yeah. So so that's this. And, and I guess the sort of big deal is his sort of claim that he left or the words he used was full truth. He couldn't tell the full truth in his paper because if he did, it wouldn't have been published, right? And that he had to do this. So in a sense, he's blaming everyone else for his choices that he made when he published. <laughs> we'll, we'll come on to that. So I, so yes, I, exactly. so, so I guess yes. that the, the, the damaging thing that he's claiming essentially is that that then feeds forward yeah. to mis, uh, misinforming the public, not giving them the full yeah. picture about climate change science, and also then further into policy strategies that people will enact is that is that basically his his problem with this i think exactly what he's implying that there's lots more information out there that's relevant and that people aren't being told about it right and that's distorting our perspective on both climate change its impacts and how to deal with it you know, so yeah okay so very very um serious accusations which have very broad reaching impact before we get into the specifics which we are going to do what's your initial reactions to these claims when we were chatting just uh offline there you said it reminded you of the the good old days so what are your uh what are your overriding feelings about this mostly essentially just nonsense to a certain extent um on the other hand if i sort of try to steel man it a little bit it's somebody with a perspective and maybe a valid perspective in some sense who seems to be now claiming that this is the only perspective, right? Mm. That you know, this entire community is wrong and they can't see this, right? They can't see this truth that, that you know, that Patrick Brown can see, right? Um, without realizing that, you know, there are many reasons why these particular mm. narratives or framings develop within a scientific community, right? And, and that, you know, at the end of the day, I, I guess we'll make it a bit more, yeah. he published the paper, right? Yeah. You know, he chose what to study. He chose how to do the analysis. He chose what to focus on, right? And he submitted it, and it was reviewed, and it was published, right? Mm -hmm. And the only people responsible at the end of the day for what appears or what gets submitted and what eventually appears are the authors, right? Yeah. So the idea that somehow he was forced to publish a paper with this particular narrative is just nonsense, right? He wasn't forced to do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, he had complete control over what ended up appearing in that paper, assuming that it was accepted for publication. So, yeah. Right. So let's let's get into some of the nuts and bolts of that. So I do want to start narrowly on uh, Patrick Brown's paper uh, kind of in isolation, and then we can expand out to yeah. kind of the broader issues with with publishing in this in this field. So let's start narrow and focus on Patrick Brown's uh, recent paper initially. Um, so Patrick Brown claims that he deliberately watered down his paper and focused on how climate change increases the dangers of forest fires while de-emphasizing other variables that impact forest fires. So he claims he did this because he believes that's what prestigious journals want. And the proof of that is that his essentially simplified paper sailed through to being published in Nature. Now, I have a couple of problems with that, and I think you've kind of teed one up of those, uh, one of those up already. So, how can Patrick Brown make these incredibly serious claims of broad-based bias at prestigious journals by pointing to the outcome of a single paper review? That that to me rings alarm bells straight away when you're complaining about one particular paper, but making a a kind of broad statement about the entire field. So, so I wanted to get your your views on that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess he might argue he didn't strictly water it down. He just chose a particular focus in the analysis and 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 didn't include other things. But, you know, maybe that's a that's a pedantic point. Um, he would also, I think, argue that 
he's had at least one previous paper that did try to highlight these other factors. It wasn't accepted or was outright rejected straight away. Yeah. You think, but still just two papers. Okay. Right? So, so we'll go who's... from one, we'll give him one to two. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. And, and anyone in research who's ever tried to submit to nature should realize that your first thought is how long will it take for them to reject it so that we can rework the paper and submit it to someone else. Yeah. But the fact that an earlier one was rejected is, is not like surprising, right? Yeah. And the nature and these, you know, these big high impact journals, you know, I don't know the exact numbers. I suspect they reject many more than they accept. And quite a large number of those will be rejected initially before even going through reviews. They're, so, they're hugely oversubscribed, right? Absolutely, this, right. This, so, this. so the idea that a previous one was rejected doesn't really provide evidence that, oh, you know, he framed that one the wrong way, and if only he'd framed it the right way, it would have been accepted. It might maybe there are any number of reasons why it got rejected. And so, yeah, I, I think it's just small number statistics from one person. You really can't draw these big, broad conclusions. So, so we don't really have a big set of statistics here, right? If you were going to do this properly, you also you almost need a kind of control experiment, right? You need to submit the same paper to Journal X, which is you know a nuts and bolts climate science journal and also to nature and, and and do some statistics on this many got through at nature this many got through at you know the, the the nuts and bolts climate journal and actually work up some kind of analysis i mean just just taking n equals two and saying that is indicative of the of the broad field is it, it's not really the way to go is it and also you haven't got you haven't got the kind of counterfactual right you don't know yeah. that had he written it you know, would this have been accepted somewhere else, or if it had been written in a different way, would it not have been accepted? It's there's there's a lot of there's a lot of assumptions going on here. No, exactly. He didn't try to submit the other paper, right? He submitted the paper he yeah. chose to submit, underwent review and had it published, right? So he doesn't have that counterfactual. Um, also, I think you've got to be so careful because we all know that nature and science are looking for that often relatively mm. simple very new, yeah. very novel, highly topical result, right? It's not a journal you submit to if you've got some detailed analysis with lots of nuance, lots of complications, you know, without some nice, clean results. So, you know, that that, that is what it does. You could argue that it's a bad thing to yeah. have, but that's what it is. And the research community knows that, right? And, so, and we're going to come on to that more, but you, yeah. you're right. There's an issue of causality here as well, isn't yeah. there, right? There's, there's reasons potentially that nature are looking for things that are potentially a little bit more headline grabbing, potentially yeah. a little bit more topical, that aren't just there's a horrendous political bias running yeah. through this towards yeah. greenhouse gases. There, so we don't have the counterfactual. We've got very low statistics. There's potential issue with causality, and I guess when you have those issues, it becomes, and you don't have the statistic, it, it becomes an almost a, a tit for tat. So I, I'm just putting up a couple of tweets here in response to this issue from yeah. uh, Dr. Jonathan Foley. We've also got one from, from Zeke Hausfather, who was also at the um, at the same think tank that Patrick Brown was at. And they're arguing exactly the opposite, that look, nature did take my papers, which are talking about potentially climate science, uh, climate change not being so serious or climate change having lots of different impacts that feed into it. If you don't have the statistics, it just becomes, well, this happened to me, but it didn't happen to somebody else. And you can't really make any kind of sweeping statements as Patrick Brown has. Well, you could even go further and say there's clearly evidence that it does publish exactly yeah. the type of papers he claims that they don't do. Right. So, you know, it's not hard to find papers that seem to be highlighting how we could adapt to some of these extreme events and reduce their impact on us. Right. You know, so so if anything, there's, there's very little evidence. Well, there's certainly evidence against his sort of thesis and, and not a great deal of evidence in support of it, other than we all know that these are journals that are looking for headline grabbing papers, right? So, so there's clearly a bias in terms of what they accept. But as you say, not a great deal of evidence that is motivated purely by some political narrative that they want to promote. It does seem a little awkward that 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 someone in this piece in the in the free press is calling out scientists potentially not offering nuance, not offering the whole picture. But then they're extrapolating from yeah. two reviews themselves. So there's yeah. a there's a weird kind of tension there, isn't there? Between I, 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 did, I can't remember exactly. There was a couple of Twitter threads earlier that think, highlighted exactly yeah. that, that think, inconsistency. Yeah. This one from Sa Sam Zhang, where that, he's saying, one, yes. you know, yeah. making the kind of claims I want about non-climatic factors requires good data that's hard to get. This is this is Patrick's claim. <laughs> um, and then also Patrick, 
making huge counterfactual claims about ideology and scientific publishing doesn't require data, just vibes, small samples yeah. and inattention to counterexamples. So there's a yeah. very strong tension here. And I guess if you again were going to steal man it, you can say this is something we should be aware of. This is something we should we should be vigilant against. But there's been no real evidence presented here that it that it's a it's a serious problem in the field. Yeah, and I think something I did think, you know, just because people are pushing back against what Patrick Brown's claiming doesn't mean the opposite is true, right? Doesn't mm. mean that there aren't potential issues, that there yeah. aren't narratives that get get preferential, you know, it's easier to publish with certain narratives. It just means it's, you know, it's much more complicated than some simple argument that you must have a particular narrative in order to get published in, for example, nature. Mm. Right. Is it is it also true? I've seen I've seen a few comments now from um the review comments of this paper that have been publicly circulated. Is it true that those comments do not necessarily support Patrick Brown's claims that prestigious journals are only interested uh, in these simplistic narratives? So I've seen I've seen some of these um yeah. reviewer comments being being posted. What have, what have the reviewer comments sort of highlighted that that don't necessarily align with with what Patrick's saying? As far as I can see, at least one reviewer highlighted these other confounding factors, right, that might also play a role. They didn't push, I don't think they pushed the authors to include them, but they certainly brought them up. Mm. So it certainly doesn't seem that the reviewers were saying it's crucial that you only focus on climate change, right? They seem to highlight these other factors. You know, the authors responded, I think, probably quite reasonably, right? They said, you know, we're choosing to have a narrow focus. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. You know, and, and the paper got through, but there's no evidence as far as I can see that either the editor or the reviewers were pushing them away from highlighting these other factors. And, you know, they clearly brought them out and pointed out that they also existed. So it just doesn't seem to support the argument that, you know, there's only certain narratives that are acceptable mm. to the journal or to the scientific community. So in these review comments, it seemed it seems clear that they they would have been seemingly more supportive of this submission. Yeah if it included other variables such as vegetation types so the fuel, ignition yeah. sources, fire management activities, um, yeah. direct suppression, prescribed fire policies, fire load. Yeah. So it seems that they were they were saying your paper would be better if it had this broader scope, if it included more of these variables. The very variables that you're saying shouldn't be or, or, or are not wanted at this journal. Yeah. So it seems to be almost in, in direct opposition. I think that's right. I mean, you know, it's not impossible that had they done a paper with all of that, it would have been so complicated that it wouldn't <laughs> fit into nature. Yeah. But there's no evidence to suggest that the reviewers or the editor were sort of explicitly arguing against doing that, right? So, you know, it, it doesn't seem at all consistent with what he's suggesting. I like this tape, uh, this take from uh, Chris Chris Colos, 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 yeah, sorry, sorry, Chris, I've butchered your name about four different ways there where he said what it seems like happened here is a paper was submitted. The reviewers pushed back and said, maybe this is a little bit more complicated than you're making out. There's a lot more variables that go into yeah. this. And then Patrick Brown pushed back on them and said, well, actually, looking yeah. at this one variable in isolation is actually an interesting and valuable thing that we we should do. So he's almost f twisted their arm to get it into the paper and said, no, it's fine. I think it's OK. We go forward. And then once it's been taken on, has then complained afterwards that it was taken on, having fought the good fight and overcome the grumpy reviewers himself. Yeah. So it, it just seems a complete mess. I think that's right. And I mean, you know, you look at that and it seems perfectly normal, right? Reviewers write comments, authors respond. Maybe the editor makes a decision and it either gets published or not. That, that's the process. And, you know, I thought, you know, makes a perfectly valid argument that sometimes you want to look at something narrow and just mm. isolate that particular effect. And that's fine. Um, what I, I was, you know, before we spoke, I was just thinking about this a little bit. You know, what, what, what's unfortunate is he could have written a much more interesting piece about his reflections on publishing the paper and maybe in retrospect, saying something like, you know, maybe I, I think I should, it would have been nicer or better if I'd focused or we'd focused on, on something different and expanded things. That would be fine. Nobody would have probably jumped up and down and mm -hmm. said, oh, that's terrible. They would say, that's interesting. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Maybe we should reflect a bit more on, on the focus we put on in our papers when we publish in these high impact journals. But to frame it as almost, I was forced yeah. 
yeah. to do this. When There's no other way to go. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so, so there are valid reflections, I think, and interesting things to think about how you get papers through these, this, you know, reviewing process and into these high impact journals. But, you know, the way he's done it is just so, I mean, he's thrown his co-authors under the bus. He's yeah. effectively smearing the entire scientific community and the editors and the reviewers and the journal, rather than just saying, you know, in retrospect, I might have framed this paper slightly differently if I'd thought about it the same way now. You know, that thought of you know thought about it a bit more at the time or whatever. You know, something more reflexive yeah. on his own, you know, thinking rather than blaming everyone else. <laughs> do something that that's now that's is. always taken a little bit worse, isn't yeah. it? When, when yeah. you're throwing shade around, exactly. It, and, and ironically, again, these these comments from the reviewers were not provided, obviously, with the original with the original piece in the free press they, they've come out afterwards i don't know if this is um a react a reaction to that piece or I they're also... on the paper straight away right, right okay so so i think they might have been linked at the bottom of the paper all the time he right. didn't link it in the free press but i don't think they were made public unless i'm wrong immediately afterwards i think they might have always been public Fine. maybe he had seen them and didn't realize or something but but i think it's interesting that that someone again who is talking about nuance talking about giving the public the full picture didn't lead or involve these in the free press article. So again, yeah. there's a little bit of a tension between yeah. the things that are being claimed about what everyone else is doing and then what the actual author of this piece and the author of the paper is doing, which, uh, you know, might be something, as you say, which probably uh, they might want to reflect on slightly. You, you raised uh, an interesting point there um, because some people will say, look, you know, the author's pushback they said it would have been interesting to have these things, these other variables involved in your paper. But ultimately, they accepted Patrick Brown's push that we should only focus on climate change as the issue behind these, these forest fires. And therefore, some people are still claiming that this shows a bias because eventually they they kind of waved it through. Now, what, what do you think about having these kind of is, is it fine to have a kind of narrowly focused paper that only focuses on one variable as long as you point to the limitations of that paper or is potentially here indicative of a bias? What's your what's your thoughts on that, that they still wave yeah, I, this I, through? Yeah, I, can't, I just can't see a real problem with that. You know, scientists come up with a research question, they collect their data, they do their analysis, they, you know, they interpret it, they write a the paper, they submit it and Ideally, as you say, you you know you highlight the weaknesses, you highlight caveats, you provide some broader context. But you know, perfectly reasonable thing to do. You know, and and other people can do other things. And you know, you deal with reviewers, you deal with editors. You sometimes get things rejected because they want more. Sometimes you make a good argument for why <laughs> what you chose to do is fine. And sometimes you don't reach agreement, and the editors make a decision one way or the other. And you just go, that's the process, right? And it's one paper. Uh, so I, I I really... I guess no know, paper can tell the whole truth, yeah, right? Because exactly. otherwise you yeah. you have to write up the whole of climate science <laughs> in one paper. It's yeah. just not possible. So, so yeah, I, I, I just don't see a real problem with choosing to do something like this. And, you know, with, with the caveat that you should always highlight, you know, what assumptions did you make? What are the weaknesses of your analysis? What other things could you have done but either didn't have the, the resources to do or the data wasn't good enough or whatever. That, that's always good practice, but mm. nothing fundamentally wrong with trying to isolate a single effect or a narrow thing and then, and, and look at what effect that has rather than doing, because as you say, and you can't do the full truth in a paper. It's just simply not possible. Yeah. So, so, so would you, would you say is, is the author here is Patrick Brown not stalking, uh, stalking, stoking the very problem. He claims he's trying to fix. So he, he claims to be highlighting this problem. He claims to be essentially being a kind of whistleblower. But what, what do you think would have been the correct process here? I think you kind of alluded to it a little bit that yeah. you can always say when the reviewer pushes back, you can always say, uh, or when they wave the paper through, you can always say, well, actually, I don't think this paper is comprehensive enough. I don't yeah. want to submit this in its current form. I am yeah. deciding to take this elsewhere Well, where we can have a more broad ranging discussion about this and you, you're not, you're, you're just waving it through. What, what do you think he could have done, which might've been more kind of productive than, than the process that he went through? Well, I mean, I think the first thing is that as far as I'm concerned, authors submit the papers they want to submit, right. And that, that, you know, editors and reviewers are assuming that it's a good faith submission and that you've submitted 
the best paper you can submit on that particular re research question. You know, if at some point a reviewer says something that makes you stop and think and say, oh, hold on a second, that is a good point. We didn't do that very well. Yeah, you 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 either withdraw it or you, I mean, we've done this before. You suddenly rework a bunch of stuff yeah. and you change, you, you fix that bit. Um, and if, you know, if the editor or the reviewer is trying to push you in a direction you don't want to go, you either argue back or you, as you say, you just don't, you put it somewhere else. Just take your paper away. And, but at the end of the day, you you publish the paper you're, you're comfortable publishing. And that can include some compromise. You can have a back and forth with a reviewer and you've got to then decide, you know, do I accept this particular change or not? And, and you don't have to, but, you know, you might go, yeah, that's fair enough. I don't, I, you know not what I might have done but the reviewer thinks it's a good thing to do and the editor does and I've spoken to all my co-authors and we agree it's still you know reasonable adjustment to make in this paper but you know you, you still take responsibility for what appears and 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 that seems know. to be sort of the compromise that was reached in this case right it's like yeah. okay the paper will go forward but yeah. there will be caveats and you will say yeah. look yeah there are other things in other papers yeah. that you might want to consider this isn't the full picture so yeah. Yeah. Again, it's kind of awkward to to kind of accept those compromises, accept that discussion, fight for having this single variable analysis, yeah, yeah. and then afterwards turn around and go, "Aha! You see, no, I like mean, I was able to twist your arm and get it through." It's like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. you did a lot of the groundwork for this, so yeah, exactly. And and you know they could have put, put, submitted it somewhere else that maybe gave them more space to explore things if they wanted to. It wasn't out of the question, but you know. They wanted to submit to a high impact journal. They designed and carried out a study that produced a result that appeared to be good enough for that journal. And they've got it through peer review and, and published it. But, you know, they were the ones who submitted it and they were the ones who accepted the final version. So, you know, that's that's how it works. So so, so just finally on this, before we go to the kind of wider context of, of publishing and maybe some of those, those uh, issues that you were talking about, do you think that that any action should be taken on this against Brown? So you, you flagged up a couple of things. So some people have been complaining that, um, you know, Brown left his his co-authors in the dark on this. So, you know, it, it's not fair to to drag. I think it was seven other people into this mm -hmm. kind of what, what seems like a little bit of a a sting or a, or a or a an opportunity to write this piece. Um, nature appeared to be pushing back quite strongly um you know they've mm. complained that that this was highly irresponsible on brown's part and it doesn't reflect their high standards um the accusations of bias have kind of riled some of the the figures that you might expect and given kind of um you know grist for people who might want to push back on on climate change writ large um, yeah. by claiming that the field as a whole is kind of distorted and polluted and therefore can you trust anything within that field it seems that patrick brown's actions could have some quite deleterious effects and should there be any actions taken here and do you think any of those uh impacts are going to be big enough that they require any actions to be taken here what what, what, what do you think will happen so it depends on the context right so the paper itself you know it depends on how you interpret things but my my understanding is that in the process of preparing and drafting and submitting and going through review of this paper, they didn't do anything wrong, right? They designed a study, yeah. they collected data, they analyzed it, they put it through peer review. And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the paper, right? Now, of it, course, it's, he's not, it's not like data was fabricated to, yeah, to say something so. that was wrong. or yeah, well, yeah. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. As far as I'm aware, now, of course, his framing implies that they did something to the paper, but I, I don't think they did. I think he's just written that exceptionally badly. Um, so, you know, technically it's a perfectly fine paper with a bunch of co-authors who probably were perfectly happy with it. And he's now trying to use his perception of things to, I guess, you know, claim there are massive problems, but, you know, but I know there are some people who I think are arguing, well, he's implying that he he did something unethical, that he didn't, you know, do the analysis that he should have done in order to get it through nature and that he finessed things. And it depends on how you see that, whether he really was implying that, you know, I finessed the results in my paper to get a, a result that would satisfy nature or whether what he really means is if I had thought of, you know, if I had complete freedom, I would have written the slightly a, a paper more broad ranging paper with more, more variables. You know, and, yeah. But my 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 general feeling is no, right? This he's just written a stupid article that that is blowing up all over social media. But the actual 
paper itself and the review process and everything else was, was perfectly normal and fine. And it's an interesting paper that highlights an important effect of climate change on wildfires, right? Um, the bigger issue, of course, is what impact it has, you know, more broadly in terms of public perception of climate science yeah. and publishing and things like that. And, and you know, I don't know how, what you do about that. He's not, you know, he's he's a he can write whatever he likes in a sense, but uh, it might be nice if he owned it. Patrick is claiming to be wanting to bring, um, you know, nuanced information to the public, but it it's really has riled up uh, some interesting figures, hasn't it? It has. And I think this is very ironic because, you know, as you say, he was claiming that it's important to have these nuanced discussions about all these factors that might you know, influence the impact of extreme events like wildfires. But he's really written something that appeals greatly to predominantly the right wing media that's done a shocking job of communicating this topic to the public. So if his goal was to, you know, effectively and, and reliably communicate about this complex topic, I think he's done extremely badly. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, we can't get away from where it, where it was posted as well. It was originally yeah. posted in in Barry Weiss's exactly. um, yeah. the Free Press, which is known for being quite um, you know co contrarian and and agitating against kind of mainstream views. So uh, it's a very interesting place to post. There's, I, I know he's trying to push back against what he sees yeah. in the narrative, so maybe he sees that as a sensible place, but these people very much have a narrative that they're trying to push as well. And it's been seized on right. by, yeah. by all the people you, you would expect, let's say. Exactly. It's, it's unsurprising in a way. And it's maybe a pity that he didn't realise that would be what would happen. Yeah. it's. Uh, I mean, I guess you can't stop people who obviously have a, an agenda against climate science, who've had a long standing agenda against climate science from, from taking yeah. anything that comes across the desk and, and twisting it, right? That's not necessarily on... Uh, you know, on an individual, they they just do that with everything. So, yeah. you know. And, and I haven't heard from any of the co-authors, but my guess is he's going to struggle to, you know, collaborate with people for a while, at least, given what he's done. So I don't think people are going to be all that comfortable collaborating and publishing with him. If there's a chance he's going to suddenly write this paper about how, you know, <laughs> he had to leave out, you know, the full truth in order to get his paper published. So, so he's, he's done himself a lot of reputational damage, I think. Is is there potentially a bias here from the um, the think tank that that Patrick works with? I'm not particularly aware of of a lot of their work, but I know that the the Breakthrough Institute. I think they have a focus on. Uh, so what is it here? The Breakthrough Institute is a global research center that identifies and promotes technological solutions to uh, environmental yeah. and human development okay. challenges. So they're very much focused on kind of. Um, using technology and things to, to, I guess, to mitigate and, and solve climate change problems. So is, is there potentially a little bit of a, a kind of bias blind spot here at play? Yes. OK, so let, let me be careful here because this is opinion rather than, you know, sure. any great data. The Breakthrough Institute does have quite a techno-utopian, you know, viewpoint, I think. Right. You know, and they're very pro-nuclear, for example, which is not a bad thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Clearly, it could play a big role in yeah. In, in you know helping us mitigate climate change and um, they seem to have they got this eco-modernist view that we should as you say be using technology to help us you know reduce our impact on nature and stuff like that um so you know th there's a potential bias there that they're they're much more in favor of a narrative that promotes how we can use technology to both adapt to and mitigate climate change and hence you know, they like the idea that, you know, we are clever and hence even the extreme weather events or wildfires get more extreme. We can find ways to yeah. deal with that using various technological advances. And so, so yeah, it sounds quite Bjorn, Bjorn Longborg to me. When oh, I'm yeah. Yeah. I, th I think there is an element of that. Exactly. And, you know, and it's a perspective, but, you know, I don't completely agree with it. It's just a bit unfortunate that maybe Patrick Brown doesn't realize that there are other perspectives that people can have and that not everyone has to have a perspective that meets their criteria. Mm. And I think it's perfectly valid to be worried about the possibility that technology isn't going to be enough to deal with some of the things that we face or that not every region in the world has the, the sort of resources to do the things that the wealthy parts of the world can do. So, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why people might have different perspectives or worry about certain narratives and what it might do to public attitudes towards climate change and how we deal with it. Right. So that's the that's the single paper. Like we said, probably, you know, there's just not enough statistics there to, to, to say yeah. potentially the very broad ranging, very serious uh, things that, that, that Patrick Brown has. 
But but let's go a little bit wider. So this idea, excuse me, that scientists have to lean into a narrative that uh, that greenhouse gases are always the most important factor when looking to get published, particularly in prestigious journals. Now, there's been a lot of pushback on this. I saw this thread from uh, Richard Black, mm, yeah. who was uh, a former environmental correspondent for the BBC. He's now the senior associate for the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit. Now, he says, or he claims that that back in 2007, there was a big study on this potential uh, bias towards just talking about greenhouse gases. There was no kind of evidence um, thrown up for this. Is this idea that there's this kind of climate cabal, there's this climate narrative, there's this, uh, I think, climate mafia, as, uh, as mm. uh, Peter uh, explained it to me or described it to me. Is this kind of a very zombie argument that's been around for a, for a long time? You've been studying these ideas for a long time. Yeah. Does it does it just come up over and over again? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, there's certainly all the time people want to promote the idea that like, there's some huge bias in climate science and they're not willing to consider various arguments or ideas or narratives. And, and you know, it's just a way, most of it's a way to sort of undermine, you know, climate science research and, and sort of suggest that you know there's lots of other alternatives that they're just not willing to talk about mm. that's certainly a fairly common sort of argument that you hear and uh and richard went forward um mm. with this to point to some of the the papers in nature specifically that very much go against this this narrative like you said there's a lot of papers that 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 go explicitly against this idea that you yeah. can't have these nuanced discussions about climate change so here for example Increased Amazon carbon emissions are mainly from decline in law enforcement. So yeah. absolutely nothing to do with um, greenhouse gas emissions and very much on the on the human side, things that we can do yeah. and mitigation strategies that we can take that don't involve uh, greenhouse gases. Again, nature influencing factors in the stagnation of the bio front that in, uh, induced heavy rainfall in July 2020 in Japan. And I believe these aren't linked um, also to greenhouse gases. So you can get these papers through. So whether there's a, a, a bias or not, and we've we've seen no real evidence of that, it can't be so strong that, that these papers aren't getting through. Yeah, exactly. And I think there was even one example. I know Freddie Otto, who does this, um, what you call it, single event attribution studies that come out very quickly with analyses yeah. of how much climate change influenced events. I think there was a recent one that they did that basically concluded that it wasn't the dominant factor in a particular event. So even the people who are actively looking at how climate change influences extreme weather events don't always conclude that it's the, the dominant dominant driver, right? So, you know, the people are trying to be as careful as they, they can when they do this. I mean, not everyone gets it right, but you're right. There's not there's certainly no evidence that you can't have these more nuanced discussions either publicly or in the scientific literature. Do you think there might be a problem here? I, I just sort of it just it just came to me. But it, I mean, it seems fairly obvious that that there's potentially a disconnect between what goes on in the nuts and bolts of climate science mm. and what gets reported in the media. And we're going to come on to this, particularly with prestige journals as well, that yeah. they want sexy results. They want something yeah. that's attention grabbing. And therefore, there's there's almost a filter that you don't see the true climate yeah. science that's going on on the ground you see this filtered rarefied view of the interesting exciting or incredibly scary important stuff yeah. that gets through to the to the top layer and that's not a fair reflection of the underlying um field yes i think that's certainly true and i think there's also you can even push back on the scientists a bit and say they're not always always very good at making sure that the press releases from their papers <laughs> probably represent because they want to get into the media. Yeah. But on the other hand, there's a lot of very prominent climate scientists who are in the media a lot, you know, um, Michael Mann, Catherine Hayhoe, people like that. And their, their message is almost always about how we can do something about this, yes. how we can, we can act. You know, th their message isn't it's all too late. You know, climate change is going to have all these terrible impacts and there's nothing we can do. So there's an awful lot of people who are in the media a lot trying to promote these somewhat more positive messages while still trying to make clear that climate change is a serious thing that's going to have an impact and we need to take it. We need to be doing things. But, you know... Because if you yeah, just it, say it's all over, it's all done, that then there's almost yeah. no point doing anything, right? It's, yeah. it's just like, have a, you know, sit down, enjoy yeah. the end, you know, before it comes. 
Well, I mean, this going back a bit, something that I, when I was reading Patrick's article again, you, you sort of almost implied that the scientists are publishing, they don't want to, under any circumstance, consider that we could do things to reduce the impact of extreme weather events. And you think, but the reason scientists are studying these things and trying to highlight what climate change might do is to provide information so that we can reduce the impact of these events, either by focusing on, you know, either by reducing emissions or improving resilience and adapting, right? So, so even if the focus is what could climate change do, the motivation behind that isn't just to go see told you so in 20 years time. It's hopeful <laughs> that it's to provide yeah. information for policymakers and societies to respond. So, And then the problem just, is in 20 years, they go, if you fix the problem, then 20 years ago, ah, there was nothing to worry about in the well, first place. Yes, that's you can't issue. win, but, but that's, exactly, uh, yeah. that's part that's of it, right? right? Yeah, but need, yeah. We hope to get to that stage where we can exactly. say it was never anything to worry about. That's, yeah, that's, uh, right, that, yeah, that's exactly yeah. the goal. Yeah. yeah. So I want to come on to those. Um, we talked about there about, about things getting rarefied and, and that can happen in the press. It can also happen at these prestigious journals so is there a problem um and kind of you know patrick brown flags this up and other people have kind of flagged this up that when we want to understand the full state of the underlying science is there a problem that these prestige journals get so much pickup that people go to them for the for the, for the kind of cliff notes is it, it what are the problems with having these kind of prestige journals like nature and science kind of sat on top how do they operate and, and, and what problems do they potentially bring in? Uh, I mean, it's true that, you know, they're looking for sensational, high impact, novel, current, you know, interesting results. Um, that, that, that can create problems. It's not, you know, it's not like it doesn't. Um, but I think most researchers realize that, you know, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for this, you know, newsworthy headline grabbing result. And, you know, the scientific community should be, you know, responsible when they submit papers there to be careful and not just to, you know, massage things to make them sound more interesting than they're actually there. Um, but I think it's much more because that's where they sit than because of some political bias necessarily. You know, you could argue that they shouldn't do that, but it is kind of the nature of those particular publications. And they're generalist they're oversubscribed yeah, so exactly. i guess i guess all yeah. of these incentives lead to you're going to end up with attention grabbing things that 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 yeah. speak to a general audience i think so and you know that doesn't mean that you couldn't criticize it or maybe think about maybe a slightly different way of doing that but yeah. you know they do sit at that point for a reason and people when they get an exciting new result that they think is, is is really groundbreaking, then they'd say, well, that's nature worthy and you send it in, right? And so given that, it's maybe not surprising that some of it turns out to be, be wrong because you're right at the cutting edge. You're trying to get that breakthrough into nature or science. I don't, I don't know if I've said this already, but- I think you I said that there was that that phrase that if it's in nature, yeah, yeah you, I'll let you- uh, I'll let Well, you I think in my blog post, I said, um, it, it's if, if it's published in nature it's probably wrong but i think the correct one is just because it's published in nature doesn't mean that it's wrong right, right? so so there is this perception that's an astronomy one but i've heard that it's true across many fields that you know these are the journals that are taking that brand new breakthrough result and you know there's a there's a tendency sometimes for them to maybe overblow it and we should be much more responsible and and, and try to avoid that but you know it is breakthrough stuff and there's always a chance that that stuff turns out to be you know not right or not quite as, as exciting as at first thought and, and to a certain extent that's the nature of the game doesn't mean that it's right and that we shouldn't try to be more careful and, and be more circumspect when we get these breakthrough results but I think I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with having journals that are trying to capture those mm -hmm. those new breakthrough results right that that doesn't seem wrong to me even if as a community we could be a little bit more careful about what we submit to them and how we present it but you know that not everything has to be you know 20 page journal <laughs> papers with you know all the details having shorter ones that are highlighting these breakthrough results seems fine as long as those other ones exist elsewhere I exactly. think, which they do right. yeah yeah and and i think when we're going to touch on this the idea that you have to publish in these high impact journals to build a career it just isn't true right i mean it doesn't do you any harm certainly helps if you can get a couple of nature papers but it's not the case that if you don't get any that's the end of the game right there's plenty of people who build very which good is career. one of the things that Patrick yeah. said, right? He was yeah. his his 
his kind of pushback to, well, why did you submit it here as well? Mm -hmm. You know, I I have to play the game. You know, I was a, an earlier career researcher. And if I get into nature, then I can become prominent and I can make mm -hmm. all the points, the more nuanced points I want to make, because then people will listen to me. So yeah. so this was the pushback that that nature and science, they're the golden ticket. If I can get in there, then I can then I can be more nuanced afterwards. Yeah. And, and you know, certainly true that if you can get in there, it does you no harm, helps your CV. But it's not true that, that not getting in there is some kind of career ending failure. There's plenty of excellent researchers who publish very careful, you know, detailed studies that appear in other high impact journals and not in the sort of nature stable journals. And, you know, it's, it's perfectly fine to perfectly, you know, respectable to do that. Do you, do you think we need to de-emphasize potentially in in pretty much all fields the, the yeah. power of having nature yeah. and science papers? Because I, if people are feeling, you know, even if it's not particularly real, but if people feel that yeah. that kind of desperation to to get into these uh, these high impact journals, it seems a little bit, you know, potentially like something we should uh, we should discuss potentially guard against. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's happening to a certain extent. I think, you know, certainly I've been on lots of hiring committees and stuff recently. And, you know, it's not a big deal anymore. You really are trying to look for a much rounder, much broader, much more, you know, uh, what you call it, um, you know, people with who have much broader expertise and not just that person who's published a bunch of nature papers. Um, I was also quite heavily involved in the research excellence framework. And if you've come across that thing in the UK where yeah. you you assess publications across the whole country. And, and I, I wasn't on any of the panels, but I did hear from people that in the past, everyone thought nature papers were guaranteed top tier publications, but apparently not anymore. You know, that, you know, people are no longer seeing these as, you know, an obvious cracking paper, right? It's, it's much more nuanced even now. And we should maybe do more, but I, I think it is true that we should, it's correct that we should be de-emphasizing them a bit. Um, and I think that is sort of happening already, certainly in the UK, I think. My um, Peter uh, Jacobs was saying that you know, not only does this this happen that that people want newsworthy papers one way. He mentioned, um, and I don't know if you want to comment on these, but he says we had trouble getting the 2013 97 percent consensus paper published because it wasn't thought to be newsy enough. So this doesn't necessarily only cut one way. Yeah. The, these quote unquote narrative papers sometimes have a yeah, problem exactly. uh yeah. finding their feet because they're they're not that sexy that they're, they're saying something that you know everyone knows is the case um so it doesn't only cut against the narrative it sometimes makes narrative papers also boring for the for the press and for the exactly press. i think that's right i mean you know um, it, it's not a simple formula for how you get something into nature or get something rejected. Well, actually getting rejected might be easier, but you're right. There's all sorts of reasons why people might struggle to get a paper published. You know, it's not just because you didn't suit some narrative, you know, journals do have, I guess, editorial, you know, focuses and, and they, they look at papers and decide if they fit. And that's one of the, you know, that's one of the, normally one of the reviewer questions is, is this paper appropriate for this journal? And that's a judgment, right? So, you know, um, so indeed, it, it's it's not a simple thing about narrative. It's, you know, much more complicated. I, I, get, I guess if you want to talk about bias, just because one particular journal has a particular focus on eye-grabbing results, yeah. it, it doesn't mean that there's a bias across the whole field because those right. nuts and bolts, very deep dive, 100-page papers <laughs> with all of those variables in, are somewhere else yes. in another paper where experts go and look at them and then make yeah. their prescriptions, but yeah. they might not be as eye grabbing for the general audience. So as long as that work has been done somewhere, yes. Yes. then and, and as long as policymakers and the public are aware that that work is being done, yeah, then it's not as kind of damning as as we see when we're looking at these rarefied nature and science papers. Yeah, I think that's right. And and I mean, maybe it's slightly easier to get into the media if you publish in Nature and Science, but it's not the case that you can't if you publish in some of these other journals. There's plenty of other very good, well-respected journals that will take, as you say, these more detailed, nuanced papers that cover much more of the complexity. And you can get that covered in, in the media. You can highlight that to policymakers. And you take the IPCC reports, they're doing a 
you know, huge study, you know, they're, they're, they're consolidating yeah, yeah. the research, not just nature and science papers. So, you know. So what would we need to do? So, so you mentioned that there are some of these, you know, editorial decisions. What would we need to do to quantify and tackle any potentially pernicious biases that do exist in climate change uh, science publishing? So, so Patrick Brown has made these, these serious claims, but as we said, there's, there's not much statistics. How, what what would you have to do to actually do this experiment and and prove that there was anything pernicious like this going on? I guess it would be high statistics. Uh, and what else do you think we should be looking at to to, to be aware of? It's very tricky because because you also have to decide. In because I mean it's perfectly normal I think for a scientific community to have a particular, mm. you know, not narrative necessarily, but to have a particular focus and to maybe be biased against it. The obvious ones are we, we, we don't really want to see papers that claim CO2 doesn't cause global warming anymore, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, it depends what one means by a bias, right? You know, there are clearly things that, that will typically get rejected because, you know, the scientific community has demonstrated that they're wrong. If you're talking about there's more subtler things like, you know, do papers tend to focus on how climate change will impact, say, you know, societies and ignore all the things we could do to reduce that impact. I guess you could start to look at that and, and say, you know, is that is that true? You know, if I if I take a big sample of papers, you know, what what fraction of them only consider the impact of climate change, and what fraction of them also yeah. consider all these other things that we might do, how we might respond, adaptation measures, etc. So, so, and that that may be possible. Actually, it would take a bit of work, but you which is look really at, what Patrick should have done, right? If he exactly, wanted to make this right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, whether you think that's pernicious or not is a judgment, right? You know, got to judgment as to whether or not this is appropriate, or whether the community should do something different. I think, as I said on Twitter, one some of these things just evolve right you know maybe maybe it's perfectly fine we, we've gone through a period of trying to highlight the significance of climate change and maybe it's perfectly reasonable that we're now going into a period where people are needing to get a bit more nuanced they've got to start thinking about you know how effective might some adaptation measures be you know how how good have previous ones been how well have we done in the past to deal with this kind of thing that's fine that's evolution of the scientific community right and so you know I don't have a problem with that, but normally you do that by just starting to publish these slightly different papers. You start to highlight slightly different things. You convince your colleagues that this, these are important topics that, you, that you're addressing. And, and this idea that this is all wrong, well, maybe it wasn't. Maybe that was perfectly fine. And maybe we just the, the community is just slowly evolving to look at different things, which is exactly what happens in science, right? You don't always answer the same questions. The questions evolve over time as, as you learn more and more. So this idea that there was a big problem. So even if it turns out to be true that, and I don't think it is quite true, that the focus has been a bit too much on climate change. Maybe that was the right focus for the last decade. And into the future, we might be adjust adjusting that focus because we're realizing that there's all this other information that will be useful to be providing to policymakers and society. So, so not only has that horrendous kind of political bias not been proven in this case, yeah. there's also a more nuanced argument to be had as to whether certain focuses in research yeah. are, are more relevant at a particular time. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. So so as we kind of come come to the end of the end of this. So so in your opinion, should people be deeply concerned that climate change science publishing is deeply and irre irredeemably broken and biased? What, what, what how how are you summing this up, Ken? No, I don't think so. In fact, you know, as an astronomer, I look at it and I think it's very much the same as we do in astronomy. Right. You're exploring a complex physical system. Right. And and. You know, sometimes you go down the wrong way. Sometimes people publish rubbish papers. Sometimes people pu publish excellent papers. It's just people doing research. And I, I've seen very little evidence that there's this massive, massive problem in climate science publishing that needs to be fixed. Other than every research community has, you know, good science and bad science and mediocre science. It's just perfectly normal research that's going on. I, I find the idea of uh, having, you know, been in science for a long time, of of trying to get people not to publish something that was incredibly groundbreaking and important. Just exactly, th yeah. there's no way you can stop them. I know. If they think yeah. they have a, a perspective yeah. that's unique and valuable, like it's going in, it's getting exactly. submitted somewhere. Like that's that's just what's happening. Exactly. I think that's exactly right. The idea that 
scientists don't want to rock the boat is nonsense, right? They'd love to rock the boat, but they want to do it. By and they want the... to be seen to be the ones that have yeah. rocked the boat, right? Exactly. That's, the, that's, that's right. the idea. Yeah, indeed. Good stuff. So um, I've got a, we've come to the end of, a, of the questions that I had. I've got a, a section for any other business. Ken, if you want to, if you want to, uh, to round us out or anything else that you think is worth raising about this, this issue. No, I think we've done a pretty good job of covering most of the aspects. So it's been very interesting. Thanks. No, no worries. Thank you very much for, for taking the time. I really, I really, really appreciate it. I know you've got a, a barbecue to run off to soon. So uh, you've yeah, got a yeah. lovely, uh, a lovely afternoon in store. Um, yeah. I'm going to put down all of your um, links in the description. So links to your blog, uh, links to your Twitter. Um, you did a lovely piece on this. Uh, breaking it all down on your blog. Anywhere else that you'd like to suggest people go to learn more about climate science or this issue in, in particular? Well, climate science, of course, skeptical science is very good. They've got all the myth busting in there, if you like that. Um, real climate's good and maybe not as active now as it once was. Those are the two that I often go to. So, yeah. Excellent. So, Ken, I'd like to thank you once again. Thank you very much for taking the time on a very uh, warm and muggy Friday afternoon. Um, go enjoy your burgers and your sausages. And uh, if more comes to light on this, let's get back together and discuss it some more. That sounds good. Thanks, Sam. And thanks for the invitation. That was great. My pleasure. Thank you very much, buddy. Take care. Yes, bye. Bye now. Bye. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.